good friend that I took down to the hospital on Thursday. And we thought it would be a good day, a light day. We got in traffic, and it was a nightmare. And we just sat for, it seemed like, hours in traffic. He had to be there at 8.30 in the morning. We left at 6.30, and we were still late. Being stuck in traffic can really make you lose your cool from time to time. Or things like children spilling something on the carpet at home. I don't know if you've seen the commercial where the kid's just taking a big swig of Kool-Aid and something is done and he spews it all over the carpet and the kids, not saying anything, just put the hassock over it. Nobody's going to know, right? <laughs> Other things like losing money in the stock market or having a relationship that may go sour or facing a sudden illness is difficult for all of us. The past few weeks we've been praying for Mike and Sue Rourke because both of them have gone through some physical struggles that is just seems to be unbearable. And Sue is still not with us today because she's still not up to par. And Mike caught some virus while they were traveling. He said, I don't know how I got it, but I got it and it was miserable. We pray for one another, and when those illnesses come, it's easy to lose our joy, and so we don't want to let Satan steal our joy. We have the joy of God in our lives. We have the joy of Jesus every single day. All the things that he went through so was so that we could be a part of the joyful love of God the Father. Sometimes we just go through life with a sour attitude. You ever met somebody that's just had a sour attitude? And no matter what you said or no matter what you did, their attitude was sour. But as Christians, we need to be different than that. We need to be people who are not bogged down with the world's problems, but be joyful for the fact that the world's problems are not going to destroy us. Because it's easy to let the world destroy us. Satan is like a roaring lion, the Bible says, seeking who he may devour. And if you're sour and you're down and you're always miserable and you're always looking at the miserable things of life, you're an easy catch for Satan because he wants to steal your joy. But in Christ Jesus, we've sung about it this morning. We have the joy of Christ in every aspect of our life. But sometimes I think we just get too involved in the world. We let Satan steal our joy. Some people are just waiting for some great event, and then life will be better for them. Maybe an event like losing 10 pounds, then I'll be happy. Or finding a mate, finding that special someone that we would like to share our life with and get married to, because once I'm married, I'll be happy. And all the men and women who are married says, amen. That's not true. No, always. Maybe it's to buy that new car, or to get a new job, or maybe it's just as soon as my husband starts treating me a little bit better. Maybe then I'll find true happiness. The truth is we need to make the decision every day to start living in joy rather than living in the things of this world that can destroy us. We're not promised tomorrow. James tells us in James the fourteenth chapter, the fourth chapter of verse fourteen, you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Ever watch the steam kettle on the on the stove? For those of us who know what steam kettles are, or watch something boil on the stove and you see the steam and it rises and it's instantaneously gone. James says that's like your that's like your life. You're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised the next second. I was with somebody this week that the doctor, when he said, do I have another 10 years to live? The doctor says, I can't promise you the next minute, let alone 10 years. So we need to be living our life as people of joy. People who will find peace in our life through Jesus Christ. The Satan, Satan will always make sure that if you don't make the decision to be have joy as a part of your life, he'll make the decision for you. And it'll be a decision that will lead you totally away from God. And that's what's happening to our society today. That's what's happening to our world. We've taken prayer out of the school. 
We've taken God out of everything. We now have people that say in our pledge of allegiance to our country that we need to take the words under God out of what we say every day as we pledge allegiance to this country because it was based and founded upon God, upon Christian principles, upon biblical aspects of how we're to live our lives. And yet the world, if it had its way, would steal that away from us. Guess who that is at work? It's Satan. He's trying to steal your joy. He's trying to steal your way of life. The psalmist says in Psalms 118 and verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, but today is a day of rejoicing. He is saying, let us rejoice and be glad in it today. For today is our joy. Today is our peace. Today is our understanding of a God who so loved us that he was willing to send his son to die upon the cross for us. One of the hardest things that I can get, never get my mind around is the fact that God said, I love you enough, I'm going to give you my son. And I'm going to watch him die in agony. And I'm going to have to turn my face away from him because he will bear all of the sins of the world. You know whose sins those were? Those were my sins. Those were your sins that put him on the cross. So we say, well, it was the Jews and the Romans that crucified Christ. Yes, maybe in a physical sense, but my sin put him there. And God willingly did that because he loved me. And he wanted to be, me to understand that love so that I would be joyful in my life. Joyful in the way that I live my life. This is the day which the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Is that the way you wake up every morning? Is that the way you start your day? Before our heat feet hit the floor, do we say, God, thank you for all you do for me. Please help me today to be more joyful, to find a way that I can spread that joy to those around, around about me. Help me to be the type of person that lives the joy and not just talks about it on Sunday morning when everything is good and peaceful and calm. God says, I am the great I am. Not tomorrow, not the God of yesterday, not the God of tomorrow, but I am the God of today. Our God is a right now God. He still lives in our life. He's still active in our life. The Bible tells us when we're obedient to him in baptism and our sins are washed away, the Lord adds us to his church and the Holy Spirit makes his dwelling within us. That should make us joyful people, should it not? Shouldn't that give us a different outlook on life than the world has? If we look exactly like the world and act exactly like the world, and do the same things that the world does, and our whole priority is things, we miss out on what life is really all about. God has produced the joy in our life. We don't need to waste a minute being depressed or down. We need to let the Spirit of God bubble up in our lives like, like living water, like streams of living water. And that living water is, is water that is alive, that is alive and, and gives us strength and gives us the willingness and the ability to go on with life. But it's a spiritual welling up within our lives. Do we spiritually take God with us every day? There are a lot of negative things that can happen to us today. We can be treated unfairly, and we are at times. But the truth is, we need to be people of joy. When I think about that, I think about those early Christians. As they walked, walked arm in arm, as they walked into the arena to be torn apart by lions. You know what they were doing? They were singing, praising God. There was such a joy in their heart. They said, it doesn't make any difference who takes our body, but we get to go be with the Lord. My goodness, I wonder if we really have the joy of God in our lives. If that's how we would walk in the arena to be torn apart by Satan. Because the truth is, 
We're in the arena every single day. Every single day, the world would like to snag us in and bring us along with them, and Satan wins. He will make the decision as to where we're going to spend eternity. But God says we can make that decision. We can make that choice. We can be a part of the body of Christ that not only lasts now, but lasts throughout eternity. Is that a joyful thing? Or is that something we just say, oh, well, yeah, I went to church today. That's about the extent of my Christianity. It has to be the joy that wells up within us. And sometimes I think we get so bogged down in the world, we just forget. This is a new day, and God has a new beginning for you every single day, every single moment. Each moment is, belongs to God. It's not ours to burn up. It's not ours to sit idly by and do nothing. It's ours to show forth the joy of God. Sometimes we get depressed. Sometimes we begin to have a pity party. And what does a pity party do for us? It makes us feel so good. No, it drags us down. We need to dry our eyes and realize that I'm not going to let Satan's lies control me. Listen to what John says about Satan in John the 8th chapter in verse 44. When Satan lies, he speaks in his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So he lies to us that this is a better way and following me will get be able to let me eat, drink, and be merry because I'm going to die tomorrow anyway, so it's okay. But Satan is the father of lies. And if he can dupe you into following his lies, he will destroy your life in eternity the Father. I'm not going to go through life defeated anymore. Listen to what Jesus said over John the 16th chapter in verse 33. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that you in me, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. I give you the joy that is in me because of my Father. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. That was his whole purpose in life. I wonder sometimes if that's our purpose. Once we're a New Testament Christian, do we just say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but it doesn't go beyond that? With Jesus, it went beyond that. It was a life that was lived so that we could spend it with him in eternity. Our life in him needs to be spent in eternity. <coughs> Satan would like to steal your joy. Because if he steals your joy, he'll steal your strength. If you have no strength, then Satan is easily can overtake you and cause you to be pummeled into a life away from God. So we need to be people who are happy, who have a good life, who have the joy of the Lord in every single facet of our life. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm, or, uh, in Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's how the psalmist David looked at life. I will bless the Lord at all times. Is that you? Everything that I say will continually be praise in my mouth. Paul says to pray without ceasing. I think this is the attitude of Paul. That all things are God's, and I'm going to listen to Him in the good times and in the tough times. In the times when everything just seems to be going great, and the times when they're not. Anybody can keep joy and a full attitude of joy if they're on the mountaintop. Everything's good. But when they begin to slide down and get into the valley of depression and dis discontentment, and the world begins to encroach, that's when they leave Christ. Some of the Christians that I know are, well, I would call them fair weather Christians. Everything's going great. I'll go and I'll be assembling with the brothers and sisters and I'll sing the right hymns and I'll partake of communion. But when things go bad, then my question for me as a fair weather Christian is, God must not love me anymore. 
He doesn't care about me anymore. That's when he cares about you the most. Remember what David said in the 23rd Psalm? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David went through tough times. David went through times when he didn't know if his life was going to be taken or spared. And yet David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear any evil. Because why? Because thou art with me. God is our strength today. God is with us in every aspect, in every phase of our life. Too many times we're like fair weather Christians. When everything's going good, we're good. When there is difficulty, that's when we tend to turn our backs on God. And those are the very times that we need to turn toward God. David, in all of the Psalms that he wrote, was adjuring God to be a part of his life and giving God the praise and realizing that he was weak and not strong. And he asked for God to give him the strength of his life. The bigger you make God in life, the smaller your problems become. Because God can conquer anything. When David went up against Goliath, David did not fear. That's amazing to me. Here's a nine foot something tall man with a big sword and a big shield. And here's David, five, six, five, eight, maybe five, nine. And he walks up against that giant and he's got a little slingshot. He's pretty accurate with it because he had drove off wild animals from the sheep, but he's got that slingshot. And he did not fear Satan because he knew his God was stronger than that giant or any of the giants in life. He did not let Satan steal his joy or his strength. And when he wrapped that slingshot around his head and let that rock fly, he knew it wasn't his accuracy, but God's accuracy that hit old Goliath right in the forehead and knocked him down. Then David took his own sword and cut his head off. A little later on, David's wielding that sword, and people go, isn't that Goliath's sword? That must be the guy that killed him and put him to death. David had no fear because God was with him. The bigger that God is in your life, the smaller your problems will be. Jesus again reminds us, these things I have spoken to you so that me, you may have peace. In the world, you'll have what? <coughs> Tribulation, trials, difficulties. But take courage, Jesus said, I've overcome the world. Once you're in me, the world has no consequence as far as where you will be with him. We need to be people of joy and of faith. Faith that I'll get through this next minute. I'll get through this next hour. I'll get through this next day with God as my helper. Even when it seems like everything's going upside down, God said, I'll be there with you. I'll walk with you. In Romans 8, and verse 28, Paul, writing to the church of Rome, says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Who was Paul writing to here? Just some Roman people over in Rome, and maybe they'd taken on, maybe they'd been baptized in the, yes. But he's writing to me, and he's writing to you. All things work together for good, for why? For to who? To those that love God. That's a promise. That's something we can take to the bank. And if the stock market crashes, we still have that in our trade, something that will last throughout eternity. And then the proverb writers writes this, in Proverbs 21 and verse 30, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that succeed, can succeed against the Lord. A horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. We get to be seeing victory in Jesus because he is the joy don't let Satan steal your joy this week. 
Don't let him just so humble you that he leads you away from God. If you're not in Christ, now's the time to, to rethink where you want to be. Where would you like to spend eternity? With the devil and his angels? That sound like a good place to me. The Bible says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It will be a miserable place. With all the liars and with all of the murderers, with all of the evildoers who have not bowed their knee to God. But if you're part of me, I will give you eternity. You get to be with me. So when you confess the name of Christ before men, when you repent and walk back in his direction and are buried with him in baptism, all of your sins are forgiven. And remember no more. Wouldn't that be great? When the husband does something, he gets the wife and she says, oh, forgive, and she remembers it no more. We know that's not true. She reminds us all too often. Remember when you, that was 35 years ago. How did you, re, well, they just kind of remember. God says, I'm not going to remember your sins anymore. They're forgiven. They're forgotten and remembered no more. That's what God does for us. That's the joy that we have in God. You'd like to be a partaker in the joy of God. Now's the time to let that be known. Be buried with him in baptism and rise to walk in a brand new life. And if you are here as a Christian, which most of us are, we need to rethink about our lives. It must be a life of joy, or else we let the world come in and squelch our joy. Let the joy of Christ spring up in your life. While together we stand.